Hey, y'all feeling good? I didn't know Derek was going to share that. I'm thinking, I would rather be at a feel-good church than a feel-bad church. The way I read it, the Bible said, this is the day the Lord has made. It didn't say, and I will despair and be sad in it. He said, I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. So we're glad you feel good. I'm glad that, that, I'm glad that works out. Uh, I, uh, we're going to start a new series this morning uh, in, in the month of August called Connections. So we're going to be talking about connecting with, uh, obviously connecting our relationship with the Lord, connections with one another. It, it's important uh, and when we think about connections. I'm going to go old school on you just for a little bit and, uh, and take you back to the 70s. My first car, 1978, was a Volkswagen Fastback. And Volkswagen Fastbacks were they're pretty ugly cars. This one was double ugly. It had, uh, it had two-tone paint that wasn't intentional. It just had like spots in it. And, and uh, the, the, the engine was in the back and had a long hood in the front. It used to freak people out when I leave the car running and open up the hood and pull my suitcase out of there. But it was, the, the thing about that car, though, that was really great was I had a Pioneer Super Tuner uh, sound system in there. Anybody remember those Pioneer Super Tuners? Man, I, listen, I can never... I can never feel bad. When I pull up next to a vehicle today and, you know, somebody's got the bass thumping and you can just, it just rattles your teeth, I, I don't think, look at, I don't go, well, look at that. And I'm like, no, I, I appreciate that. I used to be there because mine had a, my Pioneer Super Tuner, man, but, but it still had that knob where you had to tune it. So if you're looking for your favorite FM station, you had to get it on the right, nothing digital about this. I'll have to explain this to the third service. This will be, <laughs> this is going to be different for them. Nothing digital about this. You had to really nail it down or you wouldn't get it. And, and you had to make the right connection. So as we're talking about connections, this morning I'm talking about making a heart turn and I'll explain that later. But our connections have been progressive. And uh, when you think of the ways that we communicate now, I remember, I remember when email, some of you remember when email first came out. It's amazing that they keep saying email is going to go away. I, I deal with more of it now than I think I ever have. But email, the challenge of email is sometimes you can miss something in the tone or if you have to send something sensitive, you want to be careful that you're sending it by email because people can read a lot of things into it. <laughs> when email first came out, and it, was, it was pretty new. People were pretty fascinated with it. And a man up in Chicago left the, the snow-filled streets of Chicago, and he flew down to South Florida. He's on a vacation in South Florida. His wife was on a business trip, and she was going to meet him down there the next day. So when he checked in, he thought he would send her a quick email just to let her know he'd arrived all right. And he was trying to remember her email address, and he, he, he remembered most of it, but he missed one letter. And so instead of going to his wife, this email went to an elderly, elderly lady who had lost her husband just the day before. And when she comes out, she looks at the, she sees the email on the monitor, she screams and faints and falls right on the floor. And her family rushes in there and they're trying to find out what's going on. They look on the monitor and they see this email. My dearest sweet wife, just arrived and checked in. Everything is prepared for your arrival tomorrow. <laughs> and put, your eternally loving husband. And then it had a P.S. The P.S., it sure is hot down here. <laughs> email will mess you up if you're not, if you're not careful. So you say, okay, how have we progressed from email? Well, thank God we now have text. And uh, text, at least with text, we can now communicate. Uh, and you say, hey, and we can now communicate emotions because we have emojis. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe there's something about when you're over 50, you might not want to use emojis. It just frustrates my daughter to no end when I send her emojis. And, uh, and, and so I just send her emojis all the time. I found one the other day of a clown, send her a clown emoji. And, and so just, just to mess with her, but at least with text. In fact, with, with text, I like the fact that there is one emoji I use all the time. It's the thumbs up emoji. It saves me from having to write anything. I just send thumbs up everybody. And it's quick, it's short. It can communicate something, but there's, a, there's actually a better way. Uh, if you have an Apple phone, it's FaceTime. I remember when Skype first came out. Skype changed missions for our family tremendously because when Matthew was in Bolivia and then later on Peru and we were so separated, we would get together in Skype and now you can see them and talk to them. It really was the next best thing to being there. In fact, one Thanksgiving, we set the computer on the, on the table 
because Matt and, and Kelly were in Peru and we set the computer on the table and we Skype with them and they had their Thanksgiving dinner while we had our Thanksgiving dinner. And we had a chance just to be able to talk. Now, that was a great way. It's the next best thing to them being there. So improving your connections is something that we can do with one another. But how about, how do we improve our connection with God? Now, there's a, there's a, a great verse that I'm gonna read just part of in, uh, in James. And it says this, come close to God, like we sang about this morning, and God will come close to you. Now that's an open door. That's an open invitation to come close to God. And so I, I, I think for a lot of people, it's like, well, it's almost like they're struggling sometimes. How, how do I even come close to God? I read about Harry Houdini years ago that, he, of course, he was the magician and the escape artist. And uh, he, he set records on being able to break out of any jail. He, they'd say, you lock me up in a jail, leave me alone, I'll get out. Well, he used to hide, uh, he used to hide different uh, wires and things that allow him to pick locks, and so he would get out. Well, they came up with a jail that they said was absolutely un, unbreakable. And they put Harry Houdini in it, and they, they left. And uh, when it got quiet, he, he retrieved his, his tool. And as he retrieved his tool, he started working on that lock, and he couldn't get it open. I mean, he started working on it and usually take, took him seconds. Now this is taking him minutes. He's starting to sweat. And finally, he's just so frustrated. He sat down and he leaned back up against the door and it opened. And what Harry Houdini had not realized is in all their efforts to lock him in, they forgot to lock the cell door. <laughs> and so he was working the entire time on an unlocked door. And I feel like this is oftentimes, this is where people are with God. It's like the door is locked and the door is locked. No, the Bible says if you come close to him, he'll come close to you. And so as you begin to know how, we're going to talk about how this morning, as we make a heart turn, that you can come closer to God, which is a wonderful place to be. Now I want to give you a story that's found in the Old Testament. It's found uh, in the book of 1 Kings. And it's the story of Elijah where he actually confronts all the prophets of Baal. And people talk about the confrontation, but the whole idea behind this confrontation was it was to get the people's hearts turned back towards God. Let's read it here, 1 Kings. It says, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay the wood on it, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire underneath it. Then you call on the name of your gods. I'll call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered and said, it's well spoken. The nation of Israel had gotten away from God, and they'd gone a long way from God. In fact, the leadership had gone away from God. In fact, the worship of God had changed to the point where God was just was worshipped by the minority, and the majority had gone after the Baal. The Baals were a Canaanite god. The leader of Israel, King Ahab, he'd gone after the Baal. His wife, Jezebel, I remember hearing about Jezebel, bad woman. She had, she had her own goddess that she worshipped, the goddess Asherah, which was a fertility goddess, basically a sex goddess. Selling sex has been around a long time. And so they had all these prophets and prophetess, and the worship of God had gone away. And the problem was that it created a problem in the nation of Israel because they'd had a drought for three years. And in an agricultural society, that means you've got a depression for three years because there had been no crops. So they were in trouble. And the whole nation had gone. So when Elijah is coming and, and they gathered all the prophets of Baal and they gathered the people there, Elijah had a very piercing question for the people. He said, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? The word halt or falter actually means to waver. It's interesting, the actual word in the Hebrew means to hop and leap on a branch. And you can almost get the picture of a little bird that goes from one branch to another branch to another branch. And basically he's saying, how long are you going to do this? How, how can you stay in, in, in two worlds? If God is God, serve him. If Baal is God, follow him. But it's interesting that the people never answered Elijah because in their hearts they weren't settled. It wasn't in them. They should have stood up and said, we're going to serve God. But they'd gotten so far away from God. And so Elijah then continues. And we're going to continue the story right here. So Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. 
And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and I've done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you're the Lord God and that you've turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the, the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This confrontation, I'm giving you the condensed version, but this confrontation was pretty, pretty unique in that Elijah stood against all these prophets of Baal. And here's what he said. He said, here's the contest. You take a bull, you put it on an altar, you call out to your God. He said, in fact, you got so many, you guys go first. And he said, put no fire underneath it. You have to understand that the, often these pagan uh, priests would have a, a, a hidden fire that they would put underneath their altars. And so when you don't have anything real, you better put the show on. And so, man, they would call on their gods and then they'd have somebody stoke that fire and it would, it would flame up and everybody would go, ooh. That's why Elijah said, don't put any fire underneath it. He said, you call on your God. Well, he, they called on their God. He said, from morning till noon, then Elijah started talking trash to him. Love it. Old Testament trash talk. He's like, y'all need to yell louder. He probably didn't say y'all, but this is the Texas version. He said, y'all need to yell louder. He said, maybe your God is traveling or he might be meditating or maybe he's asleep and y'all need to wake him up. And boy, they did. They began to yell louder. They started cutting themselves. They said, and blood's just gushing out on the altar. I said, this is a show. You got 450 of these guys. You plus 400 of those other prophets prophets of the, that goddess Asherah. Man, you had a lot going on. There's a lot of people in there. And Elijah says, mocking them and no one answered. And then Elijah said, y'all come near to me. About the time of the evening sacrifice when they'd given up, he said, y'all come near to me. And he did something the Bible leaves. He said, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Now a broken down altar, the, these altars weren't made with, with brick and mortar. They were made with uncut stones and you'd often just lay the stones in arrangement. So if you did not maintain those altars, if you didn't use them, they could often fall into disrepair. And this altar of the Lord where they worship God had fallen into disrepair, which indicates it was abandoned. Abandoned altars usually are equal abandoned hearts. And when the hearts were abandoned, and man, they're, they're in a tough situation, but I love what Elijah says next. He said, Lord, he prays. He said, Lord, he said, we're doing this so the people would know that you're God and so that you would, you have turned their hearts back to you. Now, he had he'd done something special with his offering. He poured water on it, not once, but three times. In fact, he poured so much water on it, he just soaked the wood, soaked the bull that was laid out there, and so much water that it flooded out into a trench that was around the altar. And when God answered by fire, the Bible said it just consumed the bull, the wood, the stones, and it licked up all the water around there. And those people made a great call. They fell on their faces and they said, the Lord is God. The Lord is God. Their whole tune changed because now, now it was in their heart. God is God. And it's interesting to note that just a few hours later, the drought that had lasted for over three years was ended and the mighty rainfall came on their land. How do you do a heart turn? How do you draw closer to God? I think that's always something that, uh, that we ask ourselves. Maybe you can remember a time in your life where you were closer to God than, than you are now. Maybe you're in a great place. But oftentimes we've noticed our, our lives can go in ebb and flows. This morning I want to talk about a heart turn. How do, we, how do we get our hearts back closer to Him? One of the things that I, I want just to encourage you this morning is this. You don't have to wait for fire to fall. You don't have to wait to see something. You don't have to wait till some huge miracle comes and just slaps you in the head and you go, oh, the Lord is God. It's wonderful when that happens, but you don't have to wait. In fact, in John 20, 29, Jesus was talking to Thomas. He said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. He said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You don't have to wait for anything. You can make a choice today. I don't have to see or feel a thing. God, I'm coming closer to you. And that's something that's totally available to you. A man and his wife were in his old pickup truck. They were, they were traveling down the road in East Texas and they came up over a hill and they saw coming up the hill, they saw a, another truck coming. It looked like they had one driver, but when they got up close to it, they noticed it was a, there was two people in there and there was a girl sitting right, 
close to her boyfriend. And as they drove past, just a few minutes later, the wife looked over at him and said, you know, I can remember when we used to sit like that. And he kept driving a little bit, never took his eyes off the road. He said, I haven't moved. I think the good news this morning is if you're here going, I can remember when I was closer to God. I can remember when we were a whole lot closer. God's going to look back and go, I haven't moved. You still can come closer to him. And that's, a, that's such a key thing. But here's the deal this morning. Here's the, I think here's the good. How do we do that? So a lot of times preachers say, hey, you need to come closer to God. And oftentimes I know people can walk out in the parking lot and go, how do I do this? So I want to give you just some real practical ideas. I'm going to share an interesting scripture with you this morning. It's found in Romans. In Romans, the first chapter, Paul is talking about the condition of man. And he lists this one verse here. He said, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, this morning, so how do, you, how do you come closer to God? Is you have a personal altar with the Lord. A personal altar is a, is a place where you, you worship him. He said, these people, he said, they did not glorify him as God. In other words, they didn't honor him. They didn't esteem him. They didn't glorify him as God. They weren't thankful for all God had done. That's what happened to Israel when they left and abandoned that altar. They abandoned their hearts. So by, by just taking that verse and, and switching it, if we want to come closer to God, we begin to glorify him as God and we begin to become thankful. That's our personal altar time. You say, well, Alan, God doesn't need my worship. He doesn't need my thanksgiving. You're exactly right. He doesn't need it. We're the ones that need it because we were built to worship something. All of us are going to worship something. You see people worship celebrities. You see them worship money. You see them worship fame or sex or power or materials, goods. You name it, we'll worship it. But the idea is if you'll worship God, you'll stay on track. If you'll give him thanks, you'll stay on track. You say, well, I don't know how to do that. I'm going to give you some help this morning. I, uh, I never, was a good, I never was a good artist, but I, I figured it out early on. In fact, I, I tried to draw. And people would look at my drawings. I'd go, well, bless your heart. And, uh, <laughs> and so I learned I couldn't draw. But you know what I could do? I could trace. And I'd put a piece of thin paper over something, and, man, I'd draw that thing out. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? The book of Psalms is like tracing paper. If you don't know how to worship God... You can borrow some of these psalms and you can begin to, you can begin just to, to share. I'm going I'm to show you what I do. And, and just, this is a great way to, to worship the Lord. I'm going to take Psalms 100. It says, make a, a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, which would imply feeling good. And come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We're his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Now here's the deal. You, you, can, you can go into your own closet or prayer room or your private time and you just sit right down. You can take this psalm and you can just sit there and you can just praise the Lord with it. You say, Lord, I want to make a, a joyful shout to you. And maybe you're by yourself, you go, whoo. So, <laughs> serve, I, Lord, I, I serve you with gladness. I'm going to come before your presence with singing. The people say, well, I can't sing. Everyone can sing. Not everyone should record. Everyone can sing. <laughs> know that the Lord, he, Lord, I know you are God. I know you made me. I did not make myself. I am your people. I am the sheep of your pasture. Bad. I am yours, Lord. I belong to you. It said, I want to come into your gates. I want to thank you. I want to give you praise. I want to be thanked. I want to bless your name because, Lord, you've been good. Now, right there, you can take off. Lord, I remember when my child was sick and you healed my child. You've been good to me. Lord, I remember when I was so far in sin and nobody gave me a hope of ever turning anything, but you've been good to me. Lord, I remember when my marriage was messed up, but Lord, you helped me. You've been good to me. Lord, you've been so good to me. When I failed at the first church, Lord, you gave me a second chance. You've been good to me. Lord, you've helped me in my life. All my kids know you. You've been good to me. Lord, I want to thank you that you've been good. Now listen, that's me tracing over this psalm. You put your own words in it. And you can just begin to tell, has the Lord been good to you? If you say, well, he hadn't been good to me, then you forgot your salvation. Because if you're saved, you, you have got something to rejoice about all the time. 
But listen, what happens when you begin to do this? The Bible said when they didn't do it, their thoughts became futile, and that means their thoughts went off track. I, 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 I hear it occasionally. I hear it too much. I'll have young people come down. Mostly it's young people come down, and they'll come to me, and they say things like, you know, Alan, I, I'm starting to doubt God. Or I have parents that come say, my, my young person is starting to doubt God, and, and they're starting to doubt the existence of God. And, and I know they come to me thinking I'm going to be sympathetic, especially the young people. I look at them, I go, you don't have to go there. You don't have to go there. I said, boy, when, you, when you're tempted to doubt God, that is the time to glorify him. That's the time to begin to say, God, I know you're God. I know you're awesome. I know you've done wonderful things. And listen, if you begin to glorify him, if you begin to give him thanks, it is a cure for walking away from him. It is a cure. In fact, it is, the, it is a solution on how to draw close. You begin to do that, and that's a personal time. I love our Sundays. I love our Wednesdays when we're led in worship so well, and that's a wonderful time. But listen, you can have a personal altar in your own home. Amen. And when you have a personal altar in your own home, you say, well, Alan, I'm not a demonstrative person. I didn't say you had to just jump out in the middle of the neighborhood and do this. I'm saying you can do this on your own with the Lord. Take a Psalms. I love the Psalms in the 90s, in the 100s. You, just, you begin to go and just begin to praise God and bless him. What are you doing? You're building that personal altar. You're glorifying him. And boy, that helps keep the light cut on in your heart. You know, I, um, I think it's so important that, that we, when we talk about this, that we talk about the fact that the Lord wants to come closer to you. I was in sixth grade when... Um, Laura Winters came. I never forgot Laura Winters. Joy shared about her old boyfriend, so I'm going to share about her. I'm going to share about Laura Winters. I was in sixth grade when Laura Winters showed up at, at my school, and um, she was a new girl in, in town. I, I, thought, I thought she was cute. And, uh, I saw her look at me at, in one of my classes, and I kind of looked back at her, and uh, I... Uh, I had those glasses back then. Anybody remember those glasses? They were, back in the 60s, they had two forms of glass, black and black with lighter color underneath. Both of them ugly. And so I had those glasses on and, and for a long time I wanted a girlfriend, but I would write girls this note like, do you like me? <laughs> yes, that's a box, you could check a box. I don't, think that, I don't think they've created a text that can do that now, but you used to have to actually write this out. Yes, no, and then the other box was as a friend. I got a lot of those. I could paper a, a room with as a friend. <laughs> and, and, but when Laura Winters came in, I moved fast before anybody else stepped in. She figured out there was a lot better looking guys in the, in the whole school than I. And so I wrote her a letter. Dear Lord, I like you. Do you like me? Yes, no, as a friend. I'll never forget. I slipped the note to someone who slipped the note to her, and then it came back. It was all folded up, and I opened it up, and it said yes. And I went, huh, glory to God. This is a yes. This, this is a... This, this is a yes, and I was so glad. And we had, man, we had a great romance for a week, and it was, it was, it was wonderful. <laughs> but I had, somebody that, I had somebody that liked me, somebody that wanted to come close to me. Listen, when you understand that, that God wants to come close to you, you say, Alan, you don't know what I've done. No, but you don't know what Jesus has done for you. See, he see, the Bible said we're able to draw near to him by the blood of Christ. He paid for us to come close. He paid for us. And he gave us his spirit to lead us and guide us and help us. And then God calls us family. He doesn't call us strangers or foreigners. He calls us citizens of heaven and members of his own household. It's a wonderful way to come close. You see, when I, I remember, though, I'd gotten away from God, and I remember when the fire fell in my life. The fire fell in my life one day in October in Clear Lake City when I saw this beautiful girl in a leopard skin bikini. The fire fell. It was hot. It was her. And, it, and I'm, like, I'm like, oh, this is wonderful. And she told me she was a Christian. And I remember thinking, oh, great. Uh, now I have to use my Christian approach. But I remember talking to her, and I asked her one day. I was so smitten with her. I asked her one day, I said, do you think you and I have a future together? And she said, no. She, she smiled. She said, no. She said, the man I marry is going to be the spiritual head of my house. And, and it, 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 my heart got caught. And I remember just weeping. And I wasn't weeping because I'd been rejected. I was weeping because I knew my heart was away from God. But it, thank God, that was a catalyst. 
And that turned my heart. And I was able to come back to the Lord. And things changed in my life after that. Can I tell you this morning? Here's what I really believe in my heart. As some of you make the turn back to him, there are some droughts that have been in your life that are going to stop. There are some in unproductive areas in your life that are going to change. When we turn our hearts back toward him, we come close to him, things get better. Would you bow your head with me for a moment?